And now, please welcome the Noble Podcast. Noble. No Scotty, no Pippen, no Michael, no Jordan, no Bull. No Bull. Yeah. Hi, this is Chuck Sworsky, and you're listening to No Bull AUK, Chicago Bulls podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of No Bull a UK, Chicago Bulls podcast with me, Jimmy, from UK, Chicago Bulls. Uh, we've not had an episode for a while. It's been the off-season. There's not been a great deal to talk about, so they're going to come sort of irregularly, shall we say. Uh, and I've got a guest on today who is someone I am really excited about. I've been wanting to get him on for a while, but I know how very busy he is, especially during the uh, ball season. So uh, it was great to to get him on and uh, appreciate him being super flexible with me as well, because I've had a few is issues. But uh, yeah, Adam Amin, how are you doing, man? It'd be great to finally uh, sit down and formally talk with you. I think this is what our second time getting a chance to hang out. So absolutely, yeah, um, yeah, that was crazy. By the way, obviously in Chicago last December, um, those of you who have followed my social media would have been well aware. But one of the things on my list of, of things I wanted to do in Chicago was meet Adam and obviously Stacy as well. So uh, yeah, it, it was awesome. It was awesome to meet you guys. Yeah, we got a chance to take a photo after the game. But do, remind me, do you remember which game it was? In that December, was, was it Houston or no? Nah, that was my final game there, which was uh, sadly it was the loss against the Knicks. We played okay. Knicks uh, twice in uh, twice three in nights. Um, yep. It was the first one. Um, and I flew home the next day. Uh, so yeah, I, you were like one of the last people I managed to, but the last <laughs> on my list, I managed to get you on my last night, which was, was pretty cool. Um, yeah. Stacey tells quite a funny story actually, because I, I briefly met Stacey on my first game, which was the Wizards game the week before. Right. Uh, and I accidentally jumped a queue of people, which I didn't see. <laughs> to jump in with Stacey. Basically, <laughs> someone was having a photo with them and I was sort of just walking up and they caught me and said, do you mind taking the photo for me? I said, no, of course not. So I took a photo for them. And then as they were coming back, I said, oh, do you mind returning the favor? And I gave, sure. gave them my phone and just jumped in. And um, Stacey was a little bit like, I think he was a little <laughs> bit off. And I was like, oh, a little jarred by it. I didn't expect Stacey. To, I mean, he still smiled. and He still took the picture to be fair sure. to him. He, he should have told me where to go, really. <laughs> And I thought, oh, well, that was a bit weird. He wasn't very sort of forthcoming. And um, it wasn't until I, afterwards, as I walked off, I just saw about 100 people in the queue. Yeah. And I was absolutely mortified. Um, so thankfully, I got the chance to obviously meet yourself and Stacey like a, a, the following week. And I explained to Stacey and he was all good about it. Although he tells an awesome story on his Give Me the Hot Sauce podcast. Uh, he's an awesome storyteller. And I was listening yes. to it and my other half listened to it. And she was like, what were you doing? Because, of course, he made me sound like Godzilla just sort of run, running <laughs> through the crowd of people. So um, it wasn't quite like that, but it, it, he tells it brilliantly, probably better than I do. Um, but yeah, it was awesome because I remember you were sort of just sat down, um, sort of getting on with your uh, post game work stuff, I guess. And uh, Stacy was there lapping it up with all the fans queuing up to see him like he does. And I actually made a point of calling you. And I think you were quite surprised that I made an effort to sort of call you because you kind of <laughs> look back like me, me. And um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I told you at the time, like you keep me company, you and Stacey keep me company in the early hours when I'm sat on the sofa at sort of one, two, three o'clock in the morning. So um, yeah, you were, you were high on my list of people that I really wanted to meet. And, and to be fair, you gave me a lot of your time and I really appreciate that. And you know, you, I think you signed my jersey for me as well, actually. You and Stacey both signed it, the one behind me. So yeah, thank you to you, man, for you know giving me that time and everything else. It was, uh, yeah, it was an honor to meet you. No, I, it's it's very kind of you. It was, it was a pleasure to finally get a chance to hang with you in person. And it's, it, it is, you're so right about Stacey. He, a, he is an exceptional storyteller. It's, it's one of his, uh, he has the gift of gab, uh, as, uh, as often has been said by him and others, you know, and, and, and it's very much true. He, he has a way of engaging you and, and drawing you in and, and hitting you with a punch. He's, he's, a, he's got a stand up comics mind, you know, he's got yeah. a writer's mind. I've always kind of, I've thought of him as as that type of person that just has this mind. It's always kind of in gear, you know. He's always thinking of of the next thing, and not necessarily because he's always like trying to 
be the center of attention or something like that. He's just like, he wants to be engaging. He loves to go back and forth. And, you know, one of the things that I love about working with him is he brings me into that. You know, we, we kind of have the back and forth and, and Jason Benetti too. When, when Jason has filled in uh, over the, the last couple of years as well, you know, Jason's one of the sharpest people. I know just a, a funny person and a, and a quick wit and a smart mind. And uh, I, I really like being around people like that. And Stacy uh, epitomizes that in a major way. And, and you're right. I was, I, I'm still a little bit jarred when people say hey you know i'm still a little bit thrown off by it i'm not sure i'm getting better at like handling it i don't know if that's the right way to say it like i'm just it's just still crazy to me that that you know we get to do something so cool and and uh and get to work together and call call games together and and do this job and hang out with fans and it's it's really cool it's 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 something that i uh i I try not to take for granted very often absolutely again quickly going back on stacy this storytelling when he tells a story he puts you there, like even though you weren't yeah. in your head, you're there. He's that Absolutely. Good guy. And that's a, a, yeah, a great storyteller. Um, yeah, I mean, that says a lot about you and how humble you are. You, you still find it sort of still a, a taken back by it when people are stopping you and, and et cetera. Um, I'm not going to put myself on that level at all, but I, I partly get where you're coming from because sure. the longer my trip went on in Chicago, more and more it, people kept like so talking about it. Everybody, crazy, everybody was really excited. You know, a, a lot of the the people that that I interact with that are at a lot of games, and and you know, you just run into people out in the city or whatever. Like everybody was really excited for you that you get to make the trip and and be out as long as you were. And I know a lot of people were really excited that they got a chance to meet you. It was so crazy. I mean. I mean, the, my very first game, uh, Tim Sinclair come up to me before the game and said, oh, you're yeah. that UK ball. And I, I was like, yeah. it's Tim Sinclair, like, what the hell? How does he know who I am? And, um, it, but like, fa- like fa- and I know this probably makes me sound like an absolute jumped up whatever, <laughs> but I know, I'm not at all, trust me. But it was so bizarre to me that people were like coming up to me and then I was going to have drinks with people people I haven't even interacted with online and stuff. And some people sure. I do interact with a lot. I met up with, but it's, it's, them. it's a community, right? Like you kind of sensed it as soon as you, as soon as you got to it experience this, you incredible. sensed the community. It was incredible. And excuse me, mm-hmm. like I always say to everybody, um, Chicago gets, gets a bad name famously. Right. And I cannot so, I mean, you, you were born in Chicago and raised in Chicago, so you know exactly what Chicago is, okay? It's nothing like what people claim it to be. Like, a, of course. I, I read somewhere recently, somebody called it a war zone or something. And um, honestly, I could not believe everything that happened to me. So obviously I got a, a lift home from Will Perdue from the Windy City yeah. game. Um, everyone I met, yourselves, everybody was so, so friendly. Um, I even met Joakim Noah and stuff like that. But the biggest yeah. thing for me on that trip was just how friendly the people of Chicago were towards me. That was what, forget everything else, so that everything else was awesome. That was what really blew me away. They made me feel at home. And since I've been back, I've had messages, we can't wait for you to come back. We got, you've got to get your back, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That, the, the, honestly, I, I, I've only been once. <laughs> But I look at Chicago as my second home in a weird way. I know that probably sounds crazy, but that's how welcome I was made to feel while I was out there. Especially I was I was solo. I was on my own for that trip. Yeah, it's and I understand. And and yeah, the you hear that talking point, you know, that that gets very. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people use it for various purposes, but from my viewpoint, it seems to be used in in politicizing one side or another, whatever point yeah. people seem like they think they're making. And it gets frustrating, you know, like uh, I think the mantra for a lot of us who uh, are from here, from the suburbs of here, live here, whether it's in the city or in the suburbs now, uh, I'm, I'm in the city, not far from the United Center. Uh, every major metropolis is going to have issues because it's just by sheer volume of people, of course, you're going to have some course. issues. I get frustrated with the rap and the mantra amongst those of us who are here has just become like, like you're not from here you don't you know shut up about it because you just yeah. don't you just don't know and it's never it's never as bad as anybody who hasn't been here or lives here makes it out to be there they hear it people have a tendency to repeat things that they hear because they want to feel like they know so that the brain can make this kind of you know this connection and, 
And anytime people say anything, it's because their brains are trying to convince them of it. So they feel better. That's, that's yeah. all it is. They can justify Absolutely. something. They can identify something. That's what our brains try to do constantly. So I try to remember that uh, it's a, it's annoying and it's frustrating, but like my job as a representative of the city that I come from, this would be whether I was here or anywhere else. My job is to just be a good representative of where I come of from and my, my background. So like, you know, I'm, I'm a Midwest kid and most of us who are here are Midwest kids. You know, a lot of us stay here or if we're from the Midwest or one of the States around here, we moved to Chicago because yeah. it, it's the biggest city in our area. And the common thread is, I'm, and I'm sure it's this way in England. I'm sure it's this way in Europe in general, where you go to different regions of different countries. There's a personality quirk or a trait that is associated with that or, you know, here yeah. it might be the well, East Coasters, you know, people in New York are a little bit more brash or a little tougher or whatever. If out West, oh, they're more laid back. It's more calm. And to a certain extent, all these are somewhat true for various justified, understandable reasons. And in the Midwest, it's Midwest nice. You know, our job <laughs> is to make you feel at home and our job is to make you feel welcome. So I, I find, I, you know, we were talking about it earlier. You're fascinated by like cultures and things like that. I love kind of trying to relate you know, our country to your country and you're like, all right, well, what, what, what's the personality quirk of this area of England or this area of Wales or this area of France or this area of Spain or whatever it is. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Every, yeah. It's everywhere, isn't it? Um, I, I go back to the, the, the thing with Will Perdue when I got a lift home and, and I made it, I asked him if I could make a video because I didn't, I wouldn't believe it myself. Never mind expect anyone else to believe that, that happened. And on the video, when I mentioned that he was giving me a lift back to the hotel and the vid, I sort of turned the camera to him and his response was, it's the Chicago way. Yeah. And I, everyone sort of made a, a, a watch that video. So many people messaged me and said, I love that he said it's the Chicago yeah. way like and everyone was so proud of that and that kind of sum, like I said that summed up my trip with just how friendly everyone was towards me it was yeah I mean I can't I, I don't know when I'm going to get back because it absolutely crippled me financially but um, <laughs> I, I want to get back soon I, I keep joking to my other half it's my 40th next year and I yeah. keep joking about coming back for that I think there's absolutely no chance we kind of made a deal that she wants to go to Uganda <laughs> to see the mountain gorillas it's on her bucket list oh wow awesome and uh I said, look, if you let me go to Chicago, that will be the next big one. Um, okay. And that's not cheap. So uh, no, I, you, I don't you're, think trying to do, you're trying to do right by those around you. That's that's yeah. always acceptable. And, and, and listen, she it. was awesome to let me go. Alone. I don't think there's many people that would let their other half go uh, to Chicago on their own for nine nights. So, um, <laughs> yeah, she, she was awesome for that. So I'll be back one day. I just don't know when yeah. it's going to be. And I, yeah, I can't wait, man. I absolutely love the place. I really, really do. Um you obviously were born and raised in Chicago, like we said. And I'm quite intrigued. I, I didn't know that your your dad was from Pakistan originally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he was. Uh, he was there for half his life, basically. Oh wow. Okay. So, well, what made him move to Chicago in particular? You know, I I never really got a full grasp of it, and the way he kind of presented it to me was, you know, whether it's it, it's kind of a very standard American dream immigrant story, where it's, you know, I want to a little bit more freedom or the opportunity to make money or to have your own business or not deal with, I guess there was some governmental strife in Pakistan. Not that the country of Pakistan has ever dealt with any type of governmental strife before. <laughs> That's a very niche political reference to uh, the, uh, I guess, president and prime minister who, or the president who just got, the president is a former cricketer who just got arrested for corruption. So. Oh, wow. Okay. That, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Right. At times that you could say that was the Chicago way at times in, uh, in our, in our city's political history as well. But, um, no, I, uh, he, whatever, you know, kind of governmental strife and issues that they were dealing with, uh, he felt it was a good idea for him to try to come to the United States, more opportunity and things of that nature. And, uh, he actually left his wife and three kids, my mom and my three brothers. Uh, I hadn't been born yet, but, uh, he, left Pakistan in 1978, late, late 1978. And it wasn't until 1985 that my mom and three brothers all were able to come over. The, the way my father wow. explained it to me, yeah. The way my father explained it to me, he and his brother came, both left their wives and kids. And apparently like they could, they, they had enough of a pool of money to where they could bring parts of the family, but not everybody. And 
you know, my father was like, what do I do? Do I bring my wife and two of the kids and leave the oldest? Like, that's not going to work out. Uh, do I bring just the kids? Well, I can't take care of them because I have to work. Uh, I can't leave, you know, the missus, you know, the, can't leave my missus alone by herself. And uh, all these permutations he was going through just didn't work. And his best solution was for him and his brother to go by themselves and just keep sending money back, which is not an uncommon thing by any means no, either. No. I feel like in, in, in these stories and uh, yeah, but not a lot of phone calls, you know, it's a, a lot of money collect calling in the 1980s. Uh, international calling was very expensive. So not a, uh, a luxury that they could afford letters every couple of months with the money. My mom still has some of those uh, letters written in, oh, in wow. Arabic in uh, in a shoebox in her closet and uh, wow. i can't imagine she would have an easy time separating from those wow that's incredible i mean i whew, can't even imagine how hard yeah. that must have been for, for both of your parents um i don't know have you have you seen the film rise about the anti compose i i have not seen the full movie now okay, i've seen so clips I, of it i actually watched it on the way over to chicago funnily enough um and, and that kind of, I mean, I was emotional. I was crying my eyes out watching that. Sure. I'm not ashamed to admit it. And it, it, a very similar kind of thing, slightly different. And yeah, I, I can't even imagine. But, you know, they, you obviously your dad and, and your mum did that for, for you guys, I guess, for the, for what they believe was best for you. So, yeah, that, that's incredible, man. Um, hats off to, to everyone for getting through that. I, yeah, it's yeah. crazy. I'm, sorry, I'm fascinated by things like that because I'm so... Sure so privileged and just yeah obviously never sort of had to experience anything like that thankfully very luckily um you touched there about cricket obviously is massive in pakistan um and it's it's pretty big over here to be fair of course it's not sure. in the states the, i think the americans don't get cricket at all no um, do you are you a fan of the game or is it something sort of you never because you didn't really probably grow up with it obviously being born there but i didn't grow up with it uh, the way my father did the way my oldest brother did um, it just wasn't something that, that connected with me, but I have very fond memories of watching test matches and, you know, the, these three day whirlwinds between India and Pakistan, you know, I watching those matches over a weekend with my father, you know, we, we have good memories of that. Uh, there was cricket on the other day and I stopped and watched for like four or five minutes and just oh, kind of, wow. it's like, thought, you know, it's like just brought a few things back and it's like, yeah, this is, it's enjoyable to me. And it is one thing that I would like to do. Uh, I've never been to England. I've been to Europe a, a few times, France and Spain and Italy. Uh, I've never been to England before, and I would very much like to go. And if, if the opportunity uh, presented itself, I think going to a cricket match and, and obviously a proper football match would be uh, would be on the bucket list for me. Yeah, man. If you do it, hit me up. We'll meet up. Yeah. We'll, we'll make yeah. that happen. I'd love to come Sounds with you. Good. Cricket, cricket is basically just a day of drinking. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's hilarious because Americans don't get the fact that you can get um, a five-day event that can end in a draw. <laughs> and it's just... <laughs> But you know what? If they're if they're spending the whole day drinking, then they're winning anyway. I guess, exactly right. So that's exactly. fine. That's perfectly fine. I mean, fine. I'm not I'm not a huge cricket fan. I've got to admit, but um, I'll watch it. I'll watch any sports. To be fair, I'm I'm pretty um, yeah, I'm pretty open to anything like that. So yeah, yeah if you come over, yeah, we'll make that happen. Um, talking about football, assuming you mean soccer to the, to the American listeners. Um, sure. Have, do you have you got an English team at all or? I don't. I, I've never. Uh, it's another sport that like, you know, it's it's tough, Jimmy, because like I have so much RAM in my head, you know, just just capacity that I can that I can hold on to when it comes to sports. And it's one thing like you and I are, are talking on the day of like the Ted Lasso finale, you know, like that's that's my biggest exposure, like longest term exposure other than playing FIFA which I'm sure a lot of Americans, like I would think they could probably get into soccer and get into, you know, proper English football by playing FIFA. And I don't think that's a silly thing to, you know, have be exposed to Not at all. Uh, by any means, to, you know, through a video game. I, I love that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't really have a proper English football club that I, that I'm a supporter of. So, you know, the Ted Lasso thing I've really enjoyed because that's become like my de facto, I know they're not obviously not a real team, but they are in FIFA, so I guess technically I can I can be a supporter of them. But that's as close as I have. I, I don't have this connectivity to most sports that I don't cover. It, it's just kind of diminished over time. Over time, you know, it's part of part of the job. And, yeah, of and course. part of and, and part of it of just being able to separate and turn it off a little bit. It, it's hard for me to get uh, get jazzed up now for sports outside of what I'm covering. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I've actually never watched Ted Lasso. That's terrible, isn't it? 
Oh no, no, it's not at all. I've it's just it's just something it. that like that's my that's my. I you know, want to watch it because I I, I yeah. love I forget the actor's name. It's escaped me. Um, you, the, the uh, Jason Sudeikis. Yeah. Yes, I love him. I think he's absolutely brilliant. So he's great. Yeah. I need to make an effort to watch that. Um, which, yeah, I've never watched it, which I'm ashamed of. So you haven't got a team. So I'm going to introduce you to a team called Portsmouth. Okay. Um, they're terrible. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's, this is going to be a really hard sell. I'll be honest, but that's where I'm from. <laughs> Um, they're in League One, which is like the third tier of English football. It's not sure. great. Um, we're not looking like we're going to go up anytime soon. Uh, don't worry about it. You find your own team. It's, <laughs> I, 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 I've got nothing really to sort of try and persuade you to be truthful. <laughs> well, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me. I've always been fascinated by the idea of relegation, and yeah. there's something about the system that I happen to like. I don't know. What it is, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, this tiered system, it seemingly feels more fair and equitable somehow. Everybody gets a chance to move up and you have to maintain a certain level of, of uh, success to stay, you know, to, to enjoy the spoils of it, so to speak. So I've always found that system fascinating. I, w- I would be, I would have been curious to know if at any point would that ever come to American sports or if, if. I don't know if a triple A minor league baseball team suddenly got a chance to play in the major leagues because, you know, they're better than Oakland, you know, so again, very <laughs> specific niche American sports joke, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it is interesting because there's certainly no tanking that goes on. Um, and <laughs> the playoffs here is a completely different thing to the playoffs that with American sports, of course, because the playoffs for American sport are about two teams going for the championship, whereas here they're going for promotion, etc. So, yeah, yep. it's 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 different. But of course, there's draws as well in football, which there isn't in uh, your NFLs, your basketballs, etc. So it's well. To be fair, we do we do have them in the NFL. We do see a couple every year. It feels like it, but not in not in obviously in in playoff play. Yes. So right, and okay. it's. That I, th- I think it. Gosh, I'm not there, a big a NFL lot, fan. Lot... I, so they don't go to overtime like they do with basketball. Then in a standard regular season game, they do, they they do they they play a ten oh. minute overtime. Oh, okay. With some modified rule adjustments, not a lot, but uh, in in the regular season they play a ten minute overtime. In the playoffs they play just overtime until somebody finishes oh, yeah. and somebody oh, wins. Okay. So that makes sense. That makes sense. Um but yeah, if you come over, I, I promise I won't take you to a Portsmouth game. We'll go and watch like um <laughs> I don't know, Arsenal or Man City or someone worth <laughs> watching. I, I definitely and, unless you really need some sleep and you're struggling with some insomnia and some um <laughs> jet lag, then I'll take you there. It will do you the world of good. Other than we'll that just... we'll go and watch someone decent. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. Oh man, um, we've got to talk some balls. We've run out, like sure. completely way off, um, which is awesome. But yeah, let's talk some balls. So let's talk about when you got the job with calling the balls with Stacey. Obviously, uh, everyone was aware that Neil Funk was was going to be retiring, and there was a few names in the hat. Um, Stacey quite often jokes that. I think he says there were 17 names in the hat and Mark Shanowski was number 17. He's always winding him up on his <laughs> podcast. Um, Stacy said it and, and, you know, some might say, well, he's bound to say that now, but I felt it as well, listening to those balls games and the different people coming in. And I'm not trying to blow smoke just because you're on this, but I kind of felt there was a standout candidate for this, which was obviously yourself. And that's not taken nothing away from uh, Jason Benetti, Mark Chanelski, sure. uh, all the other guys that stepped in. Um, and Stacey said it himself, look, something I wasn't actually aware of, that he even thought about stepping away with Neil, uh, which I didn't even know was on his mind. I don't think many did at the time. And then you come in and you guys kind of just hit it off and Stacy was sort of like, well, I'm staying, this is it. And um, how, how is it for you? I guess what I'm getting at is how is it for you as a Chicago, you're born and raised in Chicago, you're a Chicago sports fan. You grew up in the nineties with that Bulls team. And how, how the hell do you, obviously you, you, you called a lot of amateur sports and, and, and coll- collegiate level and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you were just thrown in randomly out of the blue, but how how does it feel getting that gig is what i'm getting at i guess of, of a team that you grew up watching and loved i mean it must just be so surreal it it still is um 
hard, hard to believe sometimes. And, uh, you know, like I said, I still get kind of thrown off by, by people recognizing that, you know, because they're, when people recognize things like that, it's because I think they find some level of relatability or connectivity because we, you know, we're the same, we're kind of the same people, you know, we're fans. We, we all have the same memories of, of those nineties eras teams. And, and Stacy is the, one of the deepest, I think, connections that bulls fans have to that era obviously the myth and the mythology and the legend of you know the the greatest players to play the game you know the pippins and the jordans and you know the rodmans and the and 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 the big stars so to speak of some of those teams or the more more well-known names are very familiar to a lot of people but stacy is the deepest connection i think or at least certainly one of them that fans still have because he's so directly engaged yeah with with, with the audience, you know, that grew up, you know, people my age who grew up during that time, people older than me who've been watching Bulls games beyond just the Jordan years and people younger who maybe, you know, only know the Derrick Rose era, but know Stacy from his commentating with Neil for all those incredible moments in, in that era, you know, playoff games and, and, and the like, and in big moments, et cetera. So, you know, there's there, he has such a deep connection with, the, the fan base. So the way you feel about him or the way fans feel about him is how I feel about him. So, I mean, I, I imagine that a lot of people can imagine, you know, I, I would think that a lot of people could imagine how I feel because we come from the same spot. Like imagine just if you were in my shoes, we have probably this very similar backgrounds in terms of our fandom. So I think it's awesome. Uh, it's still definitely surreal. Uh, it's, it's a trip when I, you know, hear Stacy say things like that because it means a lot to me. Um, I just wanted to be a good successor and then a good partner and and uh, and try to do the job well. And I, I hope I've done that. I, I feel good about it. You know, so far, I think I, I think it's been a great experience and to become friends with these people too. Not just like, oh yeah, Stacy and I are partners and we have a good time, but like he's a friend of mine. Like we talk, we chat, we're always texting. You know, me, him, and our producer Mark Brady who we always make reference to on yeah, our broadcast. Yeah. You know, he's, he's a, you know, a Chicago sports Zelig, you know, he's seen the, some of the greatest moments in Chicago sports history over the last 30 years while he's been in this industry, 30 or 40 years. And, you know, the three of us are always in contact. We're always trading memes or gifts or videos or silly text. Stacy sends us these funny videos. You see him post uh, on his oh. Instagram and like TikTok. <laughs> we're like, puts people's the faces face and heads yeah. yeah the face changes and like he does he sends those to us too and and it's just a it's really a joy to get to have like a real like working and personal relationship with these people because it's yeah i i think people can understand how i feel about it because if i were on the outside looking in, i'd feel the same you know i'd, I'd feel the same way i i have the the same appreciation for somebody like stacy that that most of the fan base does yeah, well, it's it's a, it's an awesome duo, it really is, and I think certainly I speak for myself. I think I speak for a lot of Bulls fans. We sometimes take you guys for granted, and when there's a watch on League Pass and you two aren't there as an option, and we have to, you know, whether that be an error on League Pass and we have to watch the <laughs> the home uh, the home call, whoever that may be. I'm not gonna <laughs> single out any <laughs> any commentators in in particular uh boston celtics um <laughs> you don't realize how i love scale i love scale but Me i too. mean it's i'm not gonna throw you under the bus no don't, no, don't look please. at adam now but i i was forced to listen <laughs> to the boston call and it, i was yeah it was it, that was when i really knew and i put a tweet out and said we don't realize how lucky we are until um but you guys just make it fun. Like you spoke about it on Stacey's podcast earlier in the year. Like if it's a blowout game and stuff because of your chemistry with one another and because you're friends, you kind of just, it doesn't matter if we're losing by 20 or 30 or winning by 20 or 30, you guys still keep it entertaining, which it must be so difficult, but it comes so natural because like you just said, because of your natural friendship with Stacey, I guess, and you, you just find things to talk about and, just kind of go off on tangents and stuff like that. And yeah, oftentimes, oftentimes it's like, it's, it's like a, a side conversation that he and I and Mark maybe had on text and it's right. just something, something funny that popped up or, 
you know, we'll be joking around about something in a pregame, uh, in our pregame meeting and our pregame meetings aren't really super deep, you know, like I'll pull the curtain back a little bit on the technical side, like every morning uh, of a game, uh, Mark will text us, uh, kind of like format of our open and what we want to talk about. And, and we just leave it up to Mark. Well, the way, the way I love it is Mark is a super creative person and a really great thinker in, in terms of how TV works. He's just a really sharp guy and, and we have a great crew that supports him. Uh, so he'll just come up with the ideas. And then if something really clicks with us, you know, or, or we have like a different idea, we'll just say so and go, actually, I was thinking about doing this today because I saw this thing the other day or, or Stacy will say, hey, I was watching the game the other night. I want to talk about this thing. And Mark will go, you got it. Like, it's just, he gives us like the, the penciled in version and then we supplant or support or compliment it. And bef then before the game, you know, St Stacy's doing his preparation. I do my own preparation and we get to the arena and Mark comes into our, our little room and with Tamara, our, our graphics person and Russ, our director. And, you know, we'll just kind of shoot the breeze for a little bit, you know, we'll just chat about whatever, maybe about the game. And maybe something else will pop up that's funny or we'll have a laugh about it and we'll just kind of solidify what we're going to do. And Hey, it's six 40, come out to the table and make sure we can record. And then we'll do the crossover with the guys in studio. And then, you know, we're, we're, we're on a tip off and it's just this nice, great, easy routine that I really like because it just, everybody expects everybody to do their job. We have trust in one another to do our jobs, to be prepared, to, you know, know what we need to know that night and come together and whoever has the best idea at the right time, we'll just go with that. And I think it's a really collaborative effort. And because we have these little side conversations, if the game isn't compelling by the fourth quarter or, or it's a blowout one way or the other, you know, usually if it's a bulls blowout, then you know, you're, there's some highlights or there, you know, you'll talk about the, the 10th and 11th guys on the bench and, you know, who, you know, you go a little deeper into some stories. If the bulls are losing, then it's kind of all bets are off. We just kind of have a good time with it, you know, and we have a, an enjoyable experience. And oftentimes it just comes from this consistent level of communication, even if it's silly things that we'll laugh about at some video he sent involving like a reference to the temptations movie <laughs> sure enough later that night there might be a temptations reference and i'll know what he's talking about and i'll be able to laugh with him and you know it's 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 a really enjoyable work environment and there's a lot of good vibe that comes from that group yeah and it, like i said it certainly comes across as well and um, there's a really really funny story which i vaguely remember uh you guys talking about and and i forget what it was on but there was a game it was a road game uh and it was on is it when it's on espn they use their own they don't use you and stacy right it's one of the channels. it's for a certain TNT games yeah sometimes tnt tnt and espn like there are certain games where we do the broadcast and they do it most times if they're doing it will you know we're off so right so there was a funny story and i may have dreamt this i don't think i did i hope i didn't because this is going nowhere if i did where there was a road game i forget who it was against it was this season i believe and you showed up to the airport yeah <laughs> at, okay so i didn't dream it good no as, as per normal that. wondering where the hell everyone was <laughs> i I, I I got to the airport. This was for the Brooklyn Nets. I think it was the first Brooklyn Nets game of the season. And I remember I had a football game. I, I do NFL football on Sundays during the, during the regular season. And I was coming to Chicago. I spent Sunday at the airport after my football game for a couple hours preparing. And I was doing all these Brooklyn Nets notes. And I was like, all right, big game, right? You're going to see... Kyrie and you know Durant who was still with Brooklyn at the time you're gonna it's a big game and I remember showing up at the airport on I think on Monday for a Tuesday game and Tony like the group was there the group's going the Bulls team is going to Brooklyn and I showed up and Tony is one of our three Tony Watson is one of our three excellent security guards uh, that, that travel with the team and you know make sure the players are, are safe and not bothered and, and all that stuff and they're they're we become very good friends with them and, and they're great people and they do a wonderful job. And Tony just looks at me and goes, Adam, what are you doing here? 
I was like, what are you talking about? This is, we have a game. We have a road game. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, I don't have you on the manifest. There's a list of people that are okay. allowed on the team playing for every trip so that, you know, everybody can keep track and, and make sure that nobody's taking up a seat or whatever it may be. Sure. And he's like, you're not on the manifest. And I was just confused. Uh, so I called Mark Brady and I asked, I was like, Hey man, what's going on? And Mark just said, Oh no, I forgot to tell you, or maybe he thought I knew. And that's fair on his part too. Cause I, I usually know these things. Uh, TNT had switched on to this bulls nets game into an exclusive broadcast. We were not going to be doing it anymore. So all of a sudden I was just at the airport for no apparent friggin' reason and just had to turn around and go back home. And at the end of it, like I was mad at myself. Here's here's, here's my emotional growth as a person. I was mad at myself and I was mad at everybody because like, why didn't anybody tell me, which somebody I'm sure said something to me and I just didn't <laughs> register it or process it or realize it. And I, then I was mad at myself and I was like, why am I mad at myself? I spent two hours prepping for a, for a team that we're going to see again. Well, yeah. At I, various points yeah. this year. I so I got a bunch of work done for the future. <laughs> I traded two or whatever hours, two and a half hours of transport to go to the airport and then go back through some traffic. I traded that for a night at home on a Tuesday in the middle of one of the busiest times of the year to enjoy watching a Bulls game at home while I'm eating dinner, eating some popcorn and sitting on my couch. And I traded that for a few hours of, of quote unquote hassle. So I'd like to think that speaks to some level of emotional growth on my part. So um, that's what I'm chalking it up to. I think it's a good idea to chalk it up to a positive. I think that's a great way of looking at it. I also, <laughs> I'm so glad because it, it's an awesome story. And um, yeah, I remember listening to it and I, yeah, I, 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 I was laughing my head off when I heard it. So I'm glad I didn't just dream it. So that, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that's that's a hilarious story. Um, let's. I'm conscious of your time. Um, but let's quickly touch on on the season just gone. Um, let, let's let's not sugarcoat it. It was a it was a very disappointing season. Sure. For the roster we had. Um, you like I said, you were on with Stacey King's podcast earlier. I think it was like March time, and you made a great point, which you worded it perfectly, in my opinion, talking about the Bulls team. And sometimes they, I think you worded it along the lines of they look at, they look for the knockout punch. Um, but this team, this roster isn't about the knockout punch. They need to get their wins by, I think you said like body punches and jabs and stuff. You worded it way better than I just did, by the way. <laughs> that basically sums the team up, doesn't it? That, we, that we've just watched last season. Um, you know, let, let's, let's be honest, Lonzo, I feel like we're a broken record. We keep talking about it, and and the, the recent news coming out is it, just mm -hmm. terrible. Uh, if Lonzo's in that team, we're talking about a completely different season, aren't we? Very much so. I, I think I, I think we really got a chance to see and appreciate his game. You know, Paul George was talking about this recently as well. Paul George has a podcast, the the, the Clippers Forward, yes. and he was saying like he was really complimentary of Lonzo ball because of all the things he can do. He goes, what can't he do? You know? And, and other than just, you know, his health is the biggest issue. Like everything he can do everything on the floor. And I think we really got a chance to appreciate his value this year. You know, I, I know the second half of last year, they were still winning games or, and, and they were still, you know, a playoff team without him, but that's because they had built up such an incredible start. And, you know, DeRozan played out of his mind at various points of the years. February was incredible that season. Uh, Zach Levine was an all-star that year, had a, had a phenomenal year. So those guys really carried the load, and they had built up such a cushion that they became a sixth seed. You know, they, they avoided the play-in tournament. And this and year... we were a first seed for so much of the season for, as well, leading up to all-star break. With, with Mostly with Lonzo. Yeah. And I, I think we really got a chance to appreciate what he brings to the table when you see he, you know, his, his absence, the, the, the absence of him, uh, you can tell what kind of hole uh, was left and Patrick Beverly to his credit filled certain things yeah. that Lonzo does, but he wasn't, he was never going to do 
all None. of the things that Lonzo None. does at the level, at the consistency that Lonzo was, was going to be able to perform those things. And, and I think you really got a chance to see why a point guard is so essential to this group. And that's been the case for the last several years, you know, Kobe white was thrust into maybe being the point guard in 2020 and he wasn't ready for it. You know, Not, you can, uh, you know, I'll be fascinated to see what he, what he comes back as this summer. Uh, and, and if he's still a Chicago bull, I, I do think the bulls are going to make a concerted effort to try to keep Kobe white uh, because they, they have see what's, to after this season yeah. he's made such big improvements. I, I agree with you. And, and the other part of that too is, Lonzo's health, especially yeah. if he's not going to be available for a majority, if not the entirety of the season, then, you know, Kobe white may be the closest best option, unless you're going to go out and make a move in, in, in a trade or, or somehow in free agency or whatever it may be. So there's just a lot of, uh, of gaps left now that the bulls had previously filled by getting Lonzo ball and some of these other guys together, a see, you know, two seasons ago, but I, I think uh, it, it's a very difficult position to be in without him while still having his contract on the books and, uh, you know, everything that comes along with that. Yeah, I, I listened to uh, the CHGO podcast with Matt Peck, uh, Big Dave mm -hmm. and uh, Will Gottley. And Will Gottley made a great, great point about AK has been he's been under some pressure and a lot of people have been saying that this team he's built is, is not not great it's a terrible team sort of will actually said he didn't believe it was and i hadn't looked at it from this angle and they were yeah. saying about the pieces you put around zach levine and when you actually look at it the pieces they put around zach on paper were, were perfect yeah uh vooch who plays in the post uh damar who's clutch as hell inside the inside the art give them anything inside the art from the mid-range it's money uh lonzo with his defend defending caruso with his defending lonzo with his playmaking all this sort of stuff that he put together and i thought actually ak put together on paper an amazing yep. roster and i just i keep going back to it and i know people are going to say stop saying the same thing but lonzo is is the, is the main component of this system to work right and i said it from the yep. off <clears throat> excuse me i mean his shot was god awful when he entered the league it just it was terrible it was famously terrible but he turned into a very very respectable three-point shooter up there with zach levine who is sure. our best three-point shooter it defensively incredible okay you so is caruso so you've still got that d defensive cog there but the playmaking that lonzo has is you it's very difficult to replace that it's up there with the best in the league in my opinion from from the from the very small sample size that we have seen when he's been in the mm -hmm. Bulls uni it for me it's been up there with the best you cannot just replace that like there's n there's no one out there just to go oh we'll just take him it's we haven't got that option like you say pat bev he come in he done a job okay it, it was nowhere near on that level but anybody that was thinking he was going to be uh, they're fooling themselves where do we go? We need a point guard. And, and yeah, uh, going back to that podcast with uh, the CHGO guys, it was quite fascinating. I think it was Dave that said, "Build you've you got to build around Zach, but give him a point guard. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I was out of the big three. They're talking about possibly breaking them up. I was all for trading Zach Levine, and it's nothing against him. He's an absolute star. For me, he's not a superstar. He's an all-star. I think that level is different. But like Big Dave said, if you put a competent point guard in that team, Zach Levine does go up another level. Yeah. But who is that point guard and where do we get him? Because they're talking yeah. about potentially trading up for Scoot if, if he can drop to number three with a Portland pick. I don't know enough about college hoops to, to or of course, uh, Scoot was in the G League, but yep. I, I had an argument with Scoot and this was purely on numbers, which I hate going by numbers, by the way. But uh, Carlick Jones actually had better numbers than Scoot. He was the league's MVP. I think he, he, he scored more points per game. He had more assists per game. I think it maybe rebounds. There was one stat he was slightly below, but all the other stats had uh, Carlick Jones ahead of Scoot. Now, don't get me wrong. Scoot may turn out to be an absolute 
superstar in the NBA. But judged on that, I mean, I don't know if you know more than me about uh, Scoot Henderson, but judged on numbers, why not give Carleek Jones a try? Like, I've seen enough of him in the G League, and he, he's a very, very good player. I mean, he didn't get the MVP for nothing. I know it's a massive jump, but yeah. But what we did see of Carleek, obviously last season, I think nerves got the better of him at times, and, and I, I felt for him, and maybe a bit of rush of blood to the head as well. I, I, I don't know. I'm... I, Going around in circles, but I we need if we get a point guard, I'm all for running this team back. Is, is what yeah, I'm saying, I, and I don't want to run them back as it as it stands. I, I think that would be very foolish. But someone put to me, what if we've got uh, D'Angelo Russell? Mm, maybe, maybe um, if we could get D'Angelo Russell and Seth Curry, and I know I'm this is massively hy- hypothetical because the numbers just don't work. But if we yeah. could throw them two guys in this team, I think you're potentially, and you could keep your big three. That could work. I don't know. I, I, I'm it's, asking it's, your opinion, it's, so I'm ranting it's, on No, here, it's, but... total, it's totally understandable. <laughs> it's, 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 I think the track that you're on is representative of a lot of machinations that go on in the heads of GMs and presidents of operations across the league. Like, it's not that much different. Everybody's trying to put together the formula that works. And there, you have to have multiple formulas because one formula, one – equation is for the for the money you know you have to be able to fit money together you have to be able to be under the luxury tax and and you know the the ownership of the bulls jerry reinsdorf in particular that's been fairly well documented he's he's not paid the luxury tax and does not or maybe it was only one time whatever it was uh he's only flirted with paying the luxury tax once he hadn't signed a hundred million dollar player until zach levine you know there's some criticism of the baseball side of it as well but I do think that gets a little bit overblown, but you know, the business people are business people. They're going to do what they do with their money. I think if the opportunity was there to really feel like, yes, if moves X, Y, and Z are made, this is a championship team. I do believe that ownership would go out to try to make that work. That being said, the machinations are really hard to get there. And so that's one of the equations. The second equation is, the chemistry on the floor. And yeah, that's what yeah. you're alluding to with, with Lonzo and, and the point guard position, because I, I think people get frustrated with Zach and DeMar together. And Vucevic probably falls into this category too, just because he's going to have the ball in his hands for stretches of the game. I, I think fans can get frustrated with them because at times the, the feel of, of when to make the right play or who's got the hot hand, or do you see a matchup? on the other defense that you can really exploit at that moment. Uh, I think that the feel, you know, the, I, we, Stacey and I have been critical of it at times too. Like guy, you know, Zach Levine's going to take some quick shots once in a while. He's also to his defense, earned the right to be one of those players because he is such a prolific scorer. Uh, DeMar can make that case too. And Vucevic can make that case too. Guys can make those cases certainly in their heads. It's justifiable. I do think that, you know, and I'm looking at it from a different perspective. As, uh, you know, Stacy and I are looking at it differently than the players are in the moment and the heat of it. You know, we're looking at it from a thirty thousand foot view, and we're trying to get the feel of the game. When's the right time to make this play? So I understand when fans get frustrated with them because I can be frustrated with that too. But I also know what that comes from. When Lonzo was there, there was very little of that mm. because he was able to decipher the best play, best matchup, and really run that offense. At a, at a high level of efficiency and they got a lot of points in transition. So the touches I'm sure Zach or DeMar or whoever didn't feel like, well, I have to get a shot up because I haven't touched the ball in a while. You can negate some of that when you're just getting a pass in transition from Lonzo and dunking it or laying it yeah. in. Now all of a sudden you feel good. You're scoring points. You're touching the ball. You're in the flow and you're not worried about it. Now you're going to go focus on the defensive end a little bit more. And it's, you know, that's the type of chemistry impact that a player like Lonzo means you hear the phrase glue guy Mm. in sports very often, like, Oh, he's a glue guy. And what that, that typically means you are kind of the crux of this machine. You know, everything kind of feeds into you or through you. Through you. Yeah. And, and I think that's a really impressive skill that Lonzo was starting to develop uh, at a high level before, you know, this injury has kind of plagued him the last year and a half. 
Yeah, I mean, like I, like I said a million times, it sucks for us as as fa as Bulls fans. It sucks for basketball fans, uh, but most importantly, I yeah, I can't imagine what Lonzo's going through, and and fingers yeah. crossed he can just make a recovery for his for his life. Forget about basketball for the moment. Hopefully, he can just get back on track with his life and and live a pain free life with his kids because uh, that that's that's more important than anything else. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I know you you you're in the mindset of if you believe not for any inside info of course but you believe that the, the, the front office are going to make changes this off season as well I think don't you I don't want to put words in your mouth but I think I heard you say that somewhere that you were under the impression that they would make changes at some point um I think we're all hoping they will because running this back I, I just I, I don't know I keep going between I mean this is a team that we're talking about that beat a fully healthy Golden State Warriors um, but it's also a team that lost to a a very shorthanded Washington Wizards. And yep. the season before it was the opposite. We were beating the bad teams and losing to the good team. I, I don't know where this team is. And I think that's the frustration with a lot of fans. Is sure. I, I'm very emotional anyway. I'm either up here or down here. I'm not level-headed at all. Um, it's a terrible <laughs> trait of mine. And, and there's days where I was waking up, go, or like watching the game, and then wake up going, oh, my God, this team, we're a legit contender. Like... We looked that yeah. good on that night. We looked that good. And you're thinking, even without Lonzo, there's not a team that can beat that team I just watched over that 48 minutes. And then the next night you watch it and go, oh, my God, we should blow this up. Like, we need to tank. This team isn't going. And, and that it was it was a real roller coaster of a season, wasn't it? <laughs> sure. It, it very much was. And it's it's hard because you know you understand the talent level you know the talent yeah. level of this there's team no is question. very high yeah absolutely you know, the, I, don't, I don't think anybody looks at this roster and says well there's no talent on this right that's, that's ridiculous yeah. there's four you know four players have won all-star game or have been i've been to the all-star game uh you know caruso's got an nba championship under yeah. his belt uh you know there's a there's experience and talent and, and youth as well a good combination of of, of burgeoning young talent so uh, I, I I believe that the there are elements of this roster that, if maximized, can have a really good season. Mm. But I do think the point guard is is a is a very important factor. Um, you know, you are. I feel like if changes are going to be made, you know, that's all well and good. But you're going to have to give up pieces of your roster to make those changes happen. And the depth, the quality of the depth is going to go down a little yep. bit because in, you know, a guy who typically would be your 13th or 14th man on a roster suddenly bumps up to 10. And that's a pretty significant jump if you're trying to play key minutes. And then all of a sudden, if somebody gets hurt Injured. and that yep. person if, if, and, then, and everybody else moves up. So now that 13th guy is your ninth guy. And it really affects, you know, the quality of depth. Now that doesn't mean that people can't develop or get better, or maybe if given the opportunity, they would, they would flourish in it. The, those things happen. Javante Green's a great example of that. You know, he was kind of a castaway for the most part in Boston and, and became a fairly significant role player uh, for, for this team. And, and, and someone has, we and, really missed in my opinion as well. I agree. Absolutely. The energy that, that he brought when this team was, I, at times slow, I thought mm. in the second half of the year, and 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 I don't mean to say that they don't have energy. It was just they're a veteran team, and they're con yeah. they know how to conserve energy. And you hear a lot about that. I, I've heard Kobe Bryant talk about that. You know, the late Kobe Bryant spoke a lot about it. as he got older. He had to make decisions on when he was going to pull out certain moves, how hard he was going to work on a particular possession, depending on the the situation of the game. Mm. Uh, he wasn't trying to just go out and, and and destroy opponents every single time. He had to conserve his energy, and that's what you get with veteran players who've been around. It's it's a part of their their intelligence for the game, but it also does affect your pace. And I yeah. think that was something that we saw with with this group that you know the the pace would slow down a little bit. And I thought Javante was one of those kind of spark plugs that would that would allow the pace to be turned up and then when the younger guys were out there i think as the season went on it was implored to them to pick up the pace a little bit anyway all that being said is that there's there's elements of this roster that make up a very strong postseason team yeah but changes if they're going to be made you're going to have to give up some pieces because this team doesn't have a whole lot of draft capital as you know as as, as it's currently made up and that stung 
obviously kind of watching the draft lottery and knowing that, you know, there wasn't going to be a pick there. I, there, there can be moves made, but it's not, you know, if you're, if you're going to make those changes, it's not going to be the exact same roster that we, we've been used to seeing for the last two years. And you're going to have to pick, you're going to have to pick and choose players if they are available to be traded to Chicago. You have to smartly and shrewdly pick and choose which players you bring because they're going to have to complement one another uh, in a different way, uh, but in the same thought process that when you had Lonzo and Caruso and DeRozan and Levine and Butch, all these guys, they fit really well together, their styles and their roles. And then when you take one of those spokes out of the wheel, all of a sudden the wheel starts to wobble a little bit. You're going to have to figure out how to fix that and patch that up. Yeah, it's. I, I think a big issue is as fans we're thinking about signing a player without thinking about what we're actually might have to give up and and then of course typically fans always overvalue their own players um some of the trades you see are are ridiculous whether it's from Bulls fans or fans of other teams and you think well hang on a minute why would we make that trade (laughs) you're you're trying to trade a a 13th guy for a a fourth guy or or, or what have you so yeah fans can be very very deluded in that respect so (laughs) i mean i wouldn't want to be uh Arturas, Karnaschovas, or Mark Eversley uh, this offseason, um, they're going to be very busy. And whatever you think of them, uh, you know, they are trying their best and they're doing what they, they believe is right. And uh, I was lucky enough to meet Mark when I was in Chicago. And uh, he, yeah, he, he's a, a, a genuine guy. We certainly come across a genuine guy who, who, who told me he was, they were doing their absolute best. And yeah, I, I believe them that no one no one tries to fail in their job. So, uh, you know, all the slack that, that these guys get, whether it's the players, the coaches, the, the front office, no one's trying to fail. Everyone's trying to pull together and do their best and what they believe is right. And I think people probably forget that. I'll say it this way. I think um, very rarely, it does happen, but very rarely do you get executives who just don't belong in the job. Mm. A lot of... I think most executives, GMs, presidents, things of that nature, people who are in charge of personnel and and money decisions uh, and like kind of creating the structure, the infrastructure of an organization. I don't, most of those people are there because they know what they're doing or they have a good idea as to how to do it or what to do. Just the timeline runs out or the money runs out or the faith over a period of time wears thin or patience wears thin. I think that's all it is. I don't think there's any doubting that most people who fall, there are some examples I'm sure of people like why you don't belong in that job. You're there because of very specific reasons and, and those shouldn't be factors, but here you are in that job that you don't belong in. Very rarely does that happen in most sports, but it does happen once in a while, but I think most people who are in these positions, it's mostly circumstantial. They're, they are doing the best they can. And I, I, there's nothing you can tell me that would make me believe that these two guys, Karnaschovas and Eversley aren't super smart people. JJ Polk as well, for, for that matter. Oh, yeah, I, you, can't, you, can't convi- you can't convince me that they're not incredibly intelligent people who I do think are genuinely good humans and, and like come off as such and want to do right by the people around them and want to have some level of loyalty, but this is a very compacted timeline that you get thrust into. You know, it's, it's not an easy position to be in. You said it earlier and I agree with you, Jim. I I don't envy people in those positions because the, when the timeline crunch hits, you could have a great idea. You could have a great plan to execute it. There's too many variables that may not go your way. And all of a sudden things get derailed relatively quickly. And at the top of that list, by the way, is injury. Nothing derails. We're a a Lonzo ball injury away from talking about a completely. We're talking about AK and Mark being absolute geniuses who have built an amazing uh, roster with Lonzo, with Vooch. By the way, I make that Vooch trade 100 times out of 100 at the time they made it. I I still say it. Now it doesn't look great, granted, but at that time I make that trade 100 times out of 100. Yeah, we're one Lonzo injury away from absolutely praising those guys most of these a lot of the conversations that i've had for the last calendar year i'm not having yeah uh, because that guy's healthy and they're a much different team and maybe we're talking about a 
you know, a team that made it to the conference finals a year ago and maybe would be competing right now or maybe would have been in it somehow at this point, it's, you can't predict those things. And that's the, no. it's the least, uh, you know, and, and again, I hear people say, well, he had injuries prior. I get that. You're, but you're trying to make the best decisions. The you're also trying Zach to put Levine, your, right. You're, you're, you're also trying to put your, you're, you're trying to put your faith in people too, in, yeah. in these athletes, right. You want to give them because when you take a chance on somebody and, and they feel like they delivered for you, the, the level of loyalty that comes with that, that oh, yeah. saves you in certain situations that does go a long way with people. And as I get older, that's more important to me. Mm. I'm 36. I can't imagine what it's like for guys who are now, you know, closing in on almost 10 years in the league. Zach Levine's closing in yeah. on a decade in this league. And he got paid. He got his guaranteed money and he got his big contract, his life changing money. And now he's, yeah, he wants to get paid. He's going to get paid. All these players who get to Levine's point or beyond, they want to get paid, of course. They want to be paid their value, but most of them know that it's like, I don't really need this. It's about what's best for me. What's going to make me feel the best. What, where, who do I trust the most? Who do I feel comfortable with? Who did take that shot on me when nobody else wanted to, do I want to repay that favor because I do take pride in the type of person I want to be and what I value. Like those things do become factors in decision-making for guys. So I don't, I never want to diminish the idea of taking a chance on somebody as a fool's errand. But a lot of them, these things often look like fool's errands when the timeline gets so compacted and the results aren't there because of whatever circumstances just looks worse than it is. But I, I think these guys at the very least, I believe that they will make moves necessary in the time that they have, however long they have as the executives of this organization. It may be a year, maybe five years, maybe 10 years, who knows? Well, however long they have, I do think they're going to make smart, reasoned, logical moves and take risks that they feel like are valuable risks to take. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hope you're right. I believe that too. I trust those guys absolutely. Um, yeah, like like we say, we're an injury away of talking about absolutely praising them. And uh, yeah, you know, yeah, Lonzo did have those injuries before, but so did Zach Levine. I mean, he was yeah. literally was recovering from an ACL when we took him. And look at him, you know, multiple all stuff. So, uh, you know, these guys, they've got the best doctors in the world, the best physios in the world, etc. Lonzo's is just a freak injury. You know, there's doctors yeah. that don't know what's wrong. It's just one of those just bad luck freak things. So, oh, man. Yeah, it's depressing to talk about, isn't it? But uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Adam, I, I, I really appreciate your time on this. And I've taken up too much of it. And I apologize. But um, no worries. I've yeah I've really enjoyed this episode man so thank you so so much for coming on I really do appreciate it no worries Jimmy it's a pleasure uh, one thing I wanted to end with and I hope you don't mind me saying this um we spoke about your dad at the beginning and um I think he passed in 2018 I believe yeah um I just wanted to say and, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here as someone who absolutely you know I love you and, and what you and Stacey do uh sadly he never got to to listen to your calls on the balls uh, a team that i know he loved um but he would be immensely proud of what you do so um yeah i just wanted to touch on that very quickly man so uh, I'm, it may be speaking out of turn but from a fan the other side of the world that absolutely loves what you do uh he'd be crazy proud of you man so no uh, it's uh, it's incredibly incredibly kind and uh yeah that's it's it's not a regret or anything like that i, I do wish you would have had the chance to say he did, he did get to get a chance to see me do one game, one Bulls game, and it was the first NBA game I did. Uh, my first game was with ESPN. It was in December of 2016. Uh, I worked with Doris Burke. Uh, she and I called Tom Thibodeau's return to Chicago as the head coach of the Minnesota Timberwolves. Wow. This is when Jimmy Butler was on the uh, – was still on the bulls. I think Zach Levine was, yeah, Zach Levine was still on the Timberwolves. This is a couple months before the trade I think was made or before the injury, if I'm not mistaken, but and I might be mixing up the timeline, but it was December of 16. The bulls had a 21 point lead. They blew that lead. Timberwolves came back and won that game, oh. but it was my, but it was my, 
it was my maybe it was bad foreshadowing, I guess, but it was uh my first NBA game that wow, I had ever called I never, I never realized on that. TV. It was my first year doing the NBA. I'd go I would I would go on to do playoffs and on TV and radio for them and and it was a great experience. So my my father got to watch me do one Chicago Bulls game. Oh, that's my, awesome. NBA, my NBA debut. I do wish he would have had the chance to see me work with Stacy because course. he really did enjoy Neil and Stacy together a lot. So that would have been nice. But uh, I I think he he got a chance to see a lot of cool firsts, and uh, I'm thankful that he got to see what he did. And uh, I'm, I'm I'm thankful that you were kind enough to share that with me, and and that that does mean a lot to me, Jim. Well. Thank you. He got to listen to you. You said that was with Doris Burke you were calling. Yeah. So the queen yeah. of NBA. So, I mean, yeah. that's pretty yeah. cool, right? Yeah. Um, I was, again, a little bit of a, a name drop, but I was lucky enough to meet Doris um, on that last game. I was in Chicago as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, they were there. And uh, Drew was walking me around, and that was just after I met Mark Eversley. As we were walking, I've gone, oh, my God, it's Doris Burke. And he went, oh, do yeah. you want to meet her? No problem. <laughs> and I honestly thought she was going to be such a diva and I couldn't have been oh, more gosh, wrong. No. She was it, the kindest. One of the all time best human beings I've ever dealt with. And we've shared dinners and, and uh, post game meals and, and lunches together and along with calling, you know, several games together over the, over the last few years. And anytime I connect with her, it just, it's, it's wonderful. She's a, a wonderful, wonderful human being and, and an incredibly adept and astute analyst of the game oh, God, yeah. and one of the all-time like like cool people like you don't use the really word, use the word cool to describe people anymore because it's 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 got such a weird i'm sure it's got different <laughs> meanings for different people she is like the definition of like badass cool person like just a really sharp cool human being and, and, a, and a wonderful person yeah, she seems to be respected by everyone. And um, yeah, I honestly expected her to be a complete diva. And uh, there it is. That's, oh, that's wow. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, that's so, so cool. right, right, right before the first time I ever went on air for an NBA game, it happened to be a Bulls game and it happened to be with uh, somebody I get to call a friend now in Doris. So. That is so cool. Yeah. It's incre- I, honestly, I, I was shocked because when, when Drew said, oh, do you want to meet her? And I was like, oh, she's not going to want to meet me. Like, <laughs> And I honestly expected her just to go, no, I'm busy and just like and not be nice, even though don't get me wrong, she doesn't come all. across that way. But I just expect her to be like that for some reason. And yeah, I couldn't have been more wrong. She gave me her time. Uh, we had a photo together and stuff. Yeah, she was she was awesome so yeah, yeah yeah that was that's a what a great way to start your uh your nba ball your balls journey should i say yeah it was it was a wonderful way to start and a good and a good person to ease me into it as well yeah absolutely great. absolutely adam again thank you so much man I, i've i've honestly enjoyed this so much so yeah i really appreciate it and uh i've got to get stacy on at some point i keep yeah. trying but he keeps uh either ignoring me or doesn't <laughs> see it um but i, I want to try and get stacy on at some point because i want to call him up on basically calling me godzilla um <laughs> but yeah that, that that's going to be my next challenge but uh, yeah i've been wanting to get you on for a while so thank you so much again thank you for giving me your time in chicago um yeah it was a, a big thing for me i know you're just a normal guy to you but for me you're way more than that but um yeah thank you man i, re- I really do appreciate you so thank you no worries no problem um, guys thank you so much uh, we'll be back soon with another another episode uh i already have guests lined up for the next episode it's going to be a shocker to some people many of you might not have seen it coming but i can't wait for the next episode it's a big uk gathering big hint there I uh, can't wait to do it hopefully we'll record that next week I believe uh, it'll be out in the next couple of weeks anyway so yeah guys thank you for listening to this or watching this on YouTube thanks again to Adam he's been awesome and thank you for sharing his uh, stories not only on the balls but his personal stories as well uh, guys we'll see you next time and uh, until then go balls <laughs>